Okay, welcome to this live session. It is 1 p.m. here on the Pacific Standard Time, so we are ready to get started. My name is Amy Defoe, one of the science teachers here at Graduation Alliance. Um, again, I may be your science teacher or you may have another science teacher, um, but we're still gonna go over information that you will see in your courses and I'll also be able to answer any questions that you might have as well. So feel free to um, jump in. Um, even if I'm not your science teacher, it's still great. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, these recordings are, or these sessions are recorded and they're recorded so that if you want to come back to it at a later time, you can review the notes that you, maybe you want to go back over something that I show you, or you want to go back to that little blurb that I talked about. Little, I'm going to do a little lab demonstration here today. Um, you can go back and view those. We also record them and we set up a little library so that, um, you know, if you come to another course and you want to be able to um, see that, then you can go back and, you, you know, you'll have a nice library set of all these lessons that your teachers have been doing. And so it's going to be a great resource for you guys to, to go back and um, get a little bit more extra information and, and, and a resource, okay? Um, with that said, them being recorded, you can choose uh, on your screen, you can choose to, you know, show yourself on your video, you can also, um, your sound, you can mute yourself, um, you can keep your audio on if you want to jump in, you can respond, ask questions by um, just using your microphone. If you do need to um, talk to somebody or there's some background noise going on, please do mute yourself so it's not a distraction to in this lesson and to others. So, um, also, you can, um, if you have questions, you can say it out loud, or uh, you, of course, can use the little chat on your, um, your little Zoom meeting. You can type in your chat and that'll pop up for me. So you might see my eyes kind of drop here and there because that's what I'll be doing is checking in on that, um, that chat, make sure I, I'm answering any questions. Great, this is gonna be a good one. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about, as you can see here in our agenda, always to let you know kind of what the breakout of this session is gonna be. I'm gonna try and do a little 15 minute lesson on plate tectonics, which to me is, oh, I love this topic. So if you've been struggling with it, um, hopefully I'll, I'll help see the lights uh, on plate tectonics. And then it will have a chance to go over any questions that you might have about a particular topic. And it could be in our science, it could be in biology or another science class. So this is when it kind of opens up to you so that you can uh, answer questions, get your questions answered as well. Okay, and then I'm gonna come back and today um, for the skill, I'm gonna talk about how science is important to our lives or why is it I always get the, the question you know why do we have to study science what's important about science and I'm going to show you some examples of of why science is important um, to you and to the future of our earth as well okay and then we'll end of course with 15 minutes uh, of questions again anything else that you might want to go over that's what we're here for um, if you don't have any questions today, always think about these sessions for next time. Um, you can, uh, if you have taken notes or something, you can write down in your notes if you have a question and bring it to the next session that um, we will be doing. And that's a great way to get instant feedback from your instructors and get a, a live little lesson on a question that you might you have. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so plate tectonics. Again, this is coming from earth science uh, in the first semester of earth science. And I love this topic. Um, to me, I've always found it so interesting. The first time that I first studied it, I was, it was really hard to understand. But once I looked at the pictures and saw some simulations, little, like animations to kind of help show it, it clicked. And then I was like, oh my gosh, this is so, so amazing. So, um, has the earth always been the same? That's the question. So we think about it, we see all these maps and we have globes. And from that standpoint, yeah, the earth's always been the same, right? They wouldn't produce these, these items and put it out there if the earth was different. But we do know that over millions and millions and millions of years, the earth has changed. 
Um, it's changed in so many different ways. The composition of the air that we breathe has changed. Um, the surface of the land has changed. Um, the organisms that live on Earth have changed as well. And one thing that we're going to look at is how, uh, how the continents or how the surface of the Earth has changed and why that's happening. And the interesting thing, I think the big like, oh my gosh, is it still happening today? Yes, it definitely, um, definitely is. So we don't, we might not see it right away because we're going to talk about it in plate tectonics. We have these tiny, tiny, small, small changes that are happening, but over millions and millions of years, it adds up. Okay, so where does this tectonic activity come from? And when we talk about tectonic activity, we're talking about the movement of the plates. And we're going to go into that right now. So when scientists first started talking about plate tectonics and how the earth is changing, the surface of the earth is changing and what's causing it, um, they came up with what we call the theory of, or they went back to what we call the theory of continental drift, which was um, a theory proposed by Alfred Wegener. He proposed that the continents, they're moving. So think about right now, we are sitting on a continent. Most of us are sitting, as we can see right here. Um, we can think about the continent of North America that we're actually moving. Can't feel it, can't really see it because it's happening so slowly. But our continents are slowly, slowly, slowly moving. And as we talk about, well, what is a continent? And a continent, we usually just say it's like a big slab of rock that we live upon. But what's interesting about the continents is that the continents are part of what we call a plate. And what that means is you see in this picture, these are all of the major plates on earth so this is this would be like you know earth around earth spread out flat so we can see like in a map type of a view and you can see the different colors represent the different types of plates so these plates are giant pieces of the earth that are slowly slowly moving and when we talk about plate tectonics we're talking about all that really means is the movement of those plates okay and the other big word here is plate boundaries Plate boundaries are where two plates meet. And they're really, really important because that's where we see this tectonic activity taking place, okay? So theory of continental drift is that the continents were, they're moving and we're gonna get into what it, what it used to be like and kind of show you a little time lapse of how it's changed over millions and millions of years. So we think about it, these plates, you can see us, we, most of us, depending on where you are, you are part of the North American plate. And you can see here, I'm here in Washington State. And what's interesting here about Washington State is we see a lot of tectonic activity. And I'm gonna show you some pictures throughout this lesson today. But you can see right next to the North American plate is what we call the Juan de Fuca plate, which is a smaller plate activity uh, with the um, North American plate. And let's move on here. So Alfred Wagner proposed this. Imagine this, hundreds of years ago, a scientist says, the, the plates are moving, the earth is moving. And he came up with this idea that, of Pangea. And Pangea has been spelled, it can be spelled different ways. So you might see it spelled this way. You might also see it with another A in there. Just know it's Pangea, okay? And this idea about Pangea is that Alfred Wagner, he proposed that the earth was one supercontinent at one point in time. And that's what they named, is known as the supercontinent. That's what Pangea means, all one. And so they're talking about 225 million years ago, the earth was all together, okay? And then slowly we can see it has drifted and drifted and drifted um, away into what we see today as the present. Pretty crazy to think about. Now, when I was, when, when somebody first showed me this, I'm like, 225 million years ago, okay. Uh, how do we know this? That's the big question. <laughs> it's kind of hard to think about, you know, were you there? Were scientists there 225 million years ago? How do we know this? Did they take pictures of it? And that's where we go into, when we talk about a theory of a continental drift, it hasn't been, proven because we can't go back in time and see it firsthand. 
but there is evidence that provides this theory to be truthful and to be what's happening. And one of the biggest pieces is this idea that if you look at a map, the earth is like a puzzle. And if you were to put the continents together, they fit together. Most noticeably, when you think about South, South America and Africa, if you move those two continents together, as you can see right here, they match right up. So looking at a globe, it reveals coincidences that are difficult to ignore. The eastern coast of South America seems to fit perfectly, almost like a puzzle, into the western coast of Africa. At the same time, North America can be rotated slightly and made to fit comfortably next to Europe and Asia. So you can see right there, that's, that is definitely one big piece of um, evidence that goes along with that. And if I show you this, see if it's going to air on me as I reload it to reset it. Yep, there it goes. Sorry, guys, let me refresh this. Okay, so here we can see the continents moving over different periods of time. It's very, very, very slowly. So there we see what it was at pres in present time. Okay. Okay. So big one, puzzle piece. It, they fit right in together. Okay, another piece of evidence is fossils. Okay, fossils are the remains of organisms that were once living, or they can still be living, but I mean, a species could be living, but the organism is not. So it's like the remains of an organism. And what they found is, they found that similar, he, he noticed that there was fossil life in the rocks that didn't fit in the climates that they were found. So he might find an organism that you would find in a more desert area and it would be found down here, like in the Arctic. And you're like, that doesn't make sense. I give you another example here. Rocks in Alaska contain fossils of palm tree leaves. Now you think about Alaska. Mm. <laughs> Tropical palm trees? I don't think so. So that lets us know that something had to change. So Alaska most likely was not in the position that it is now today. It must have been much lower down in the latitudes so that it could have life that was like tropical, like a palm tree. Okay, so they found similar organisms. So like this band here shows this particular organism was found on both South America and in Africa, right? Where the, that puzzle piece fits together. And now we know, we can think about it when we look at the picture of, um, of Earth, there's a big old ocean that's separating South America and Africa. So how did those organisms get there? Somebody might say, well, they swam. But realistically, swimming that many miles, no. Um, so here you can see some other bands. And this is also in uh, the lesson. This is a great picture that shows the fossils. So fossils being found of the same organism in very, very different places, places that were separated by oceans. So at one point in time, these creatures were able to roam across here because the earth was Pangea all one. Okay, um, some other evidence is the surface changes. New land is being created at mid-ocean ridges, which we call, uh, this is called seafloor spreading, where the, the seafloor is actually spreading open and new land can then form here. And in this image here, this shows the ages of rocks. And so scientists can use technology and they can go and take samples of rock and determine the age of it. And so here we've got um, new rock. So the red represents zero. So this is fresh, brand new rock being created, new land being created. And then we go into going this direction. It gets older and older and older. So right here, we call this the mid-ocean ridge. And this is a very, very important ridge because it shows us this is brand new rock being made right in the middle of the ocean. And as that happens, each side then spreads apart and gets pushed farther away. So when we look at that puzzle piece of these two continents being together, we can see that they're being pushed away by new land being formed. And let me see, I'm gonna go up here to this one. Let me turn on some sound here. As magma wells up between the tectonic plates, it pushes the sea floor up and forms the colossal mid-ocean ridge thousands of feet high. As magma wells up between the tectonic plates, it pushes the sea floor up 
forms the colossal mid-ocean ridge, thousands of feet high. As magma okay. wells up between the tectonic plates, it pushes the seafloor up, forms the colossal... More blows out of that one. So that gives you kind of the idea of what's happening. As magma is pushing up into that ridge, and as it's pushing up, it's reaching the surface where it's then cooling, and it's pushing that other land farther and farther away from each other. Okay, so that's sea floor spreading. Okay, um, so we can see we've got this theory of continental drift and we've got evidence that supports it. Well, the question is, well, why does this matter? Okay, the earth was once together, well, great. Well, what does it mean to us now? And actually it's the outcomes of plate tectonics that gives us what we call tectonic activity. And does anybody know of any tectonic activity? Have you heard that before? When we talk about what would the movements of these big chunks of the earth, what would they cause? It has to do, it's looking at um, different surface features that we see here on earth. Okay, when we talk about tectonic activity, we're talking about earthquakes, volcanoes, mountain ranges, new land. Those are the outcomes of plate tectonics and they're pretty major. So a plate boundary is gonna be where two plates meet. And where two plates meet on Earth, it can be different because plates can move in different directions, okay? We have uh, three different types of plate boundaries. And what we mean by that is there's three different ways that the plates can move. We have a convergent boundary. And I always tell my students, okay, what do you think about converge when you're trying to um, decipher or define that word? I always think about like when I'm driving <laughs> and you have to like merge into the traffic. To my mind, I always think of converging. So that, that's where two plates are moving toward each other. So they're converging together. Now, if you have two plates that go together, what do you think is going to happen? You have two giant pieces of the earth pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing on each other. Will they go up like a mountain? You got it. Thank you. Yes. So they're going to push and you can push upwards, creating mountain ridges, mountain, mountain ranges. Okay. Um, what also can happen depending on uh, the densities, meaning how much mass is in these um, plates, one can also go underneath and then push the other one up as well. And so we can get volcanoes and we can get mountain ranges when those two plates are converging together. Okay. The opposite, divergent. So think about when you diverge the ball, what are you doing? Hopefully. So opposite of coming together, you're gonna move away. Divergent plates are when the two plates are gonna move away from each other. And that's what we saw in that example of uh, seafloor spreading, new land being created in that mid-ocean ridge. Okay. And then the last type of, of plate boundary is what we call a transform plate boundary. And that's when plates, they don't move together and they don't move apart, but rather they slide past each other. And when you have two, two big giant slabs of the earth sliding past each other, it can produce a violent, violent outcome. And that's where we usually get our major earthquakes from, is from those two, those transform boundaries that energy, once they're pushing on each other so much and they finally release, it's that release that produces that earthquake. Okay. So in this image, we can see um, the examples of the three different plates. So here we have convergent, where they are coming together. And we have divergent, when they spread apart, and transform, when they slide past each other. And then below this, it gives us a little example of, well, what does that look like on the surface of our Earth? Okay. So here we've got that mid-ocean ridge where the two plates are spreading apart from each other and we get that seafloor spreading. Here we have a convergent plate boundary where the ocean crest is going underneath what we call the continental crest. Ocean crunch is gonna be, um, it, it goes underneath and as it goes underneath, it pushes the other one upwards, creating those mountain ranges. So um, you might've noticed in, if you have, if you're currently in earth science and you're here, 
at plate tectonics, you're in that part of the curriculum. So far, um, I did a little video showing the Cascade Mountain Ranges, which are in my background back here. Um, of, this is an example of a convergent plate boundary where the ocean crust is meeting the continental crust. It dives underneath and it pushes upward, creating that mountain range. And of course, we get volcanoes in there. Um, here in my state, we have Mount St. Helens and um, Mount Rainier. You maybe have heard of those. They were also, I put them in the lesson as well. Okay. Um, transform plate boundary. Uh, again, the two plates are going to be sliding past each other. Probably the fa most famous one of that is this uh, San Andreas Fault in California. I think San Francisco. I heard lots in history about the great San Francisco earthquake. So when those two plates are sliding past each other, um, when they release that energy, it's released in the form of an earthquake. Okay, so just to kind of visualize this, I'm going to put you, this down here. I'm going to turn. This is always a fun little activity that you can do. Um, these are just some little candy bars that I have, but you can do this as well with like Play-Doh Play is a good one to use or um, clay is a good one to model this, sorry. I can't fit everything in here, so you guys are just gonna have to bear with me. So what I wanna do is just show you, I have just two pieces of, of a candy bar. It's a Milky Way, and I just kinda wanna show you what these are when you use these. So if we have a convergent plate boundary, we have, let me scoot back here a little bit so you guys can really see that. You have two plates that are then pushing together, and as they push together, they're going to push, as you can see, it kinda pushes upward like that. So think about mountain ranges. My kids are going to love to eat this later on as well. <laughs> okay, so there's our convergent when we think about the plates pushing together, the plates then buckle upwards into a mountain range. Okay. Um, divergent. It would be great if I had another set of hands here as I pull these apart, think about underneath. If we pull these plates apart, we're getting into the layers of the earth, okay? So underneath in, in the layers of the earth, we've got, um, we have the outside, which is our crust, and then we go into the mantle and into the core. And into the mantle, you get into what we have as magma. And so as magma wants to get up to the surface of the earth. And so if we, pull these two plates apart, it produces an opening in the earth where then that magma would come up between where those plates open up and that would produce new land. Okay. Um, so we talked about the mid-ocean ridge where this happens. Another important one is what we call a hot spot. And a hot spot is where we have kind of a weak point in the earth's crust that's allowing for magma to seep up through and reach the surface. And this produces island chains. So Hawaii is an example of a hotspot. Because you think about it, Hawaii is in um, a middle of a plate, but there's a weak spot in there where that magma is able to seep up to the surface, creating new land. Okay, this is the next one here. So if we have a transform, we're gonna have two plate boundaries. And what they're gonna wanna do is they're trying, they're pushing, pushing against each other. They're trying to move past each other. And when it finally, finally releases, you can see it kind of crumbles. And that crumbling is what we would see as, in a, as an earthquake. It's that release of pressure where we get um, a transform boundary moving past each other produces earthquakes. Okay, so just a little example, kind of show, hopefully kind of visualize this a little bit better. Yeah, that was really cool. Yay, thanks. <laughs> you can do it at home if you've got any candy bars laying around too. <laughs> it's a good excuse to eat it, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so these three types of plate boundaries. Well, scientists started looking at they started mapping all of this tectonic activity. So they were looking at where do we see these giant mountain ranges? Where do we see these volcanoes? And where do we see this, um, the, all, most of the earthquakes? And what they did is they mapped it. And when they mapped it, they found, so um, the yellow is gonna represent earthquake activity. And then the red's gonna be kind of like your major mountain ranges, so to speak. So here we've got the, the Cascade mountain range. And what they notice is that along plate boundaries, 
is where we get all of this activity. So here we have the Pacific plate. This is why we call it the Pacific Ring of Fire, because along the Pacific Ring of Fire, we have this ring of tectonic activity. Look at all of the earthquakes, and all of uh, the mountains, volcanoes, major volcanoes on Earth. They all fit along this ring. So this shows us that tectonic activity occurs at plate boundaries, where these two plates are moving together, moving apart, or trying to slide past each other is where we get this activity, okay? So you're thinking like, okay, great. We've got, you know, tectonic activity that happens, you know, um, here in, in the Pacific Ocean. Well, you know, we could think about preparing for our future. You know, if you decide that, you know, you want to live in these types of areas, that's something that you might want to, you know, be prepared for. It could be a, a volcanic volcano erupting. It could be an earthquake. It's just something that we think about preparing wise. Okay, so Pacific Ring of Fire. Um, this is where most of the te tectonic activity occurs on Earth because of these plate boundaries. Tectonic activity occurs where plate boundaries meet. You guys with me so far? Yep. Awesome. Okay. Well, how does this happen? What, what makes the earth, the surface of the earth move? And this is caused by convection currents. And it actually doesn't have to do with the surface of the earth. Um, it has, has to do with what's happening inside of the earth. So we think about the earth being made up of many, many different systems. And they all have an effect on each other. So what's happening in our earth, here we got our inner core, outer core, and the mantle, and of course the crust, what's happening here affects what we see on the outside, okay? Uh, convection current, has anybody heard that before? Yes. Yeah, okay. You might have, I'm trying to think, the first time I ever heard of convection, um, was looking at like an oven and you might notice on your oven there's a setting that says convection and what that means is it's a circling it's the circling of um in this case of an oven it's a circulating circulation of air convection currents in this sense with plate tectonics these are currents that are occurring inside of the earth and what's happening is this is magma okay? so it's molten earth rock okay and it's moving in a circle it's creating the circle round and round it goes and does anybody know why this happens does anybody live in a two-story house or a three-story house or have multiple stories which which floor is is the warmest the top the top does anybody know why because heat rises there you go, you guys got it, yeah. Heat rises, and so it rises in liquids, it rises in air, and it rises in material. So what's happening here is we have heat from the inner core. You know, as you get deeper and deeper into the earth, it gets warmer and warmer. So we have heat pushing upwards, and that, heat, that is then heating this magma and making it warmer and warmer and warmer, so it's rising. Well, as it's rising, it's mixing with cooler material, and cooler sinks. So it's getting heated up, it rises, it mixes with cooler temperatures, and it gets denser and it sinks back down. So it's making this giant current. Round and round it goes, okay? Well, how that has an effect is if we think about here where we have a divergent plate boundary, we have those two plates that are moving apart. What's happening is as that hot material is rising upward, it meets this cooler, denser um, rock layer and it pulls it back down with it as it's diving down, it's denser and denser, it's cooling, it's pulling that with it as well. So gravity is helping stretch it, pull it back down. And as it does that, it's stretching open those layers of the earth. And so those two plates are being pulled apart. And when it's pulled apart, then that magma can reach the top and become new earth. Do you guys think this is happening pretty quickly? No, 
maybe? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. If it was happening quickly, we would see much more change happening on Earth the earth would continue to look different and different and different. So we think about like Pangea, we're talking about 225 million years ago. So scientists have kind of measured this and what they found is that the earth is moving at about 2.5 centimeters a year. So not, not a whole lot, but if you think about it over thousands and thousands of years, it's gonna have an effect as we've seen with how the earth has changed over time. Okay, so convection currents are the driving force of plate tectonics. This is the reason why our Earth is moving very, 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 very slowly because as heat rises, it finds that opening and it pulls that plate down back into the Earth, stretching um, those, those plates apart. Okay. Okay, so like I said earlier, well, why does this matter to us? Well, we have to think about we know that we're gonna have tectonic activity in the future. We've seen it in the past, and you might hear scientists always say this, um, you know, the past kind of holds the key to the future, because we can look at Earth's history and we can get an idea of what to expect, okay? We know that earthquakes are gonna continue. We know that volcanoes are gonna happen because tectonic activity is occurring. We're still, you know, we still have the layers of the Earth. The Earth hasn't, isn't changing. We still have those convection currents continuously moving. So we can think about in the future, um, we can study, you know, how can we maybe detect these earthquakes and volcanoes more? How can we prepare for them to, you know, less any devastation that there could be? Okay. Does anybody have any questions about plate tectonics? I always found it just be a, a truly fascinating topic and maybe because I, I grew up in Washington state. And so, uh, you know, I see the mountain ranges, I see the volcanoes, I hear about the earthquakes um, all around me. And so maybe in my life, it's a little bit more like oh, in my face. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I want to go move on to the next section here. Um, questions. Does anybody have any um, topics or questions with activities that they might want to go over? And again, you can take yourself off of, you know, mute if you want to use your microphone or you're welcome to type in there. Okay. Um, I will continue on and then again, I'll, I'll come back and um, as we wrap up, we'll have another opportunity. So if you're not quite yet ready uh, to ask a question or as it hasn't come to your mind, think about it for a moment and um, we'll come back to, a, to an open question period here soon. Okay. So the next little part, how does science relate to my life? You know, we hear a lot of people say like, I'm not into science. Science is really hard. It's not my thing. Um, and I, I think about, well, you know, science is everywhere. It's a part of our life so much and we don't even really, really think about it. So um, in real terms, when we talk about it, why is learning about science important? And um, like I talked a little bit about my personal experience, um, I grew up in a family that was very, very uh, outdoorsy. My dad is hunter, fisher, every weekend we piled into the back of his truck and off we went to the ocean, to a river, to a lake, up in the mountains, over the mountain passes. And um, I also had an opportunity to travel to different places on the earth, like, you know, I'll show you some pictures here, but um, going to different rainforests and going to different islands and seeing how the earth is so different everywhere. And I always would, you know, the hours and hours of sitting in the back of the truck, uh, to get to my dad's destination, I know. Um, I would, you know, be looking at these things, and in my mind, I'm like, okay, why, why do we have mountains here? Why is this forest growing here? And then, you know, an hour later, we're in an area where there's no trees. And so I grew up always asking myself these types of questions, and it just made me interested in wanting to understand the surroundings that I'm in. Okay, so that's just my little little bit here. I'm going to show you some pictures and um, I'm actually I'm going to use. These are pictures of um, 
my kiddos and it kind of shows some of the uh, areas around us. So this is here. Um, I live in, like I said, I live in Washington state and here in the background, these are actually the Cascade mountain ranges. So why is this important for us? You know, what, why is this relevant to my life? And again, as we think about, you know, these mountains, thinking about how they were created. Um, is, is an important piece of science is understanding um, the world around us. And we can also think about, you know, if you live in the mountains or maybe you like activities such as skiing or snowboarding, um, these are the types of activities that uh, the features of earth give us. They give us recreation. So, you know, so understanding how this is created and you know what's going to happen to it is it going to change are we in harm are we okay living you know right at the base of these mountains something to think about how can we prepare if something um, might happen okay uh, and again this is here in hawaii as you think about okay well these islands some of these island ranges we talked about um, land new land being formed uh, right in the middle of an ocean like we said it's called a hot spot and how can that be and if you guys might have heard in the news in the last few months um, uh, Hawaii is actually there it's a chain of volcanoes okay and as those volcanoes are erupting it's producing new land and so in the last couple of months, there's been some um, activity that's happening there. So the people living on Hawaii uh, are, are having, you know, they have to take in consideration of that type of thing and, you know, have plans in place to kind of prepare for it. Okay. Um, seasons, day and night. Again, pictures of my, my little kiddos. Sorry, get to to my little horn, use their cute little faces, but to show you here. Um, seasons, think about if, if we didn't have a textbook or we didn't have somebody telling us, oh, okay, we have four seasons. How would we answer that? How would we know, okay, why is it sometimes we go through periods where it's really sunny and warm and then we go through periods where it's snowy and cold. And if you think about, if you didn't have these textbooks and you weren't taught about this in school, Think about, you know, hundreds of years ago when people were living off of the land and they would have to prepare, you know, they would have to think about the year ahead and thinking, okay, if they're, you know, growing their food, they have to make sure in the summertime that they're, you know, in the spring, they have to get ready to like get the land ready and cultivate it. They got to grow the crops and then they have to find a way that they can serve it to stretch it because, you know, when it comes winter, not a whole lot's going to grow. Um, day and night. Think about um, if we didn't know, why do we have day and night? Lots of people like to say, well, because we need to sleep and get our rest. Yes, but why does the earth have a period where it's light out and then we have a period where it's um, nighttime? And that has to do with the rotation of the earth towards the sun and away from the, ton, the, away from the sun. But in early societies, you might have heard of like the Mayans, um, you know, they, they came up with stories and they created types of technology to help understand these phenomena that would happen. And so, again, we can learn about why this happens, how we can prepare for it. And I guess for most of us, we can enjoy it. Last year, you guys might remember we had the eclipse. So here we are in our little, um, with our, our glasses, because of course you never ever, ever want to look at the, the sun directly with your eyes because it is too powerful and too damaging. So again, understanding a, a, an eclipse, how it happens, what's caused by. Um, earlier, early civilizations, civilizations, they thought, you know, an eclipse was like the end of the world because all of a sudden it just went dark. And, you know, they didn't have a way to understand it. Um, for fun, why is science important to us? Well, for fun, of course, you know, maybe you're into, you know, riding bikes. But transportation, think about how easily we can get where we want to go now. You know, technology and science is always improving, always um, gaining more and more. And so we can think about, you know, it used to be, horses and buggies and then they went to you know the first cars and now we think about all the different types of transportation that we have that makes our life a whole lot easier and that's one part of science is science can make life better and it can make it a whole lot easier and make things more efficient for us as well you know think about like airplanes this one 
Okay. Uh, technology. I recently got one of these fun little Apple watches for um, my birthday and I'm just thinking about it. This is, this is all science right here. This is what's making it, making this come to be. And, you know, think about it. We can take our phones anywhere now. We can take our computers anywhere. This is science. This is technology that's allowing us to do these types of, of things. Um, another kind of opposite end of that, of making our life more efficient and more enjoyable, we also have to think about science in the terms of how can we protect our planet and protect our resources? And so this is where it gets into the other hand of why is this important to you? Why is this um, relevant to you? Well, we have to think about this, the conservation of, of resources, water. How do we protect our, our water resources so that everybody has enough good, clean, quality water for as long as possible? And these are the types of questions that are facing um, younger generations where they have to learn about, okay, what can we do about water? How can we conserve it? You know, is there technologies that can be created that can help us um, purify water, keep the water cycle going? And so as you think about in the terms of why does this relate to you? Well, this is going to be part of your guys's. If you're paying bills, you might have to pay a water bill and um, paying water bills when water is a scarce um, commodity, it, it can get very, very expensive. Global warming, hot topic. So think about um, science helps us understand how global warming is happening. And then science can then help us understand what we can do about it to lessen it. Um, but ultimately then it gives us kind of an idea to make better choices. You know, what's the evidence? How do you, how do you personally feel what we should do about these types of um, events that are happening? Okay. Health advances, you know, science, technology, huge, huge uh, advancements in um, healthcare. You know, people are living longer and longer, and that's because of science, because we're, we, we're finding new medicines, we're living a healthier lifestyle. Um, the good, and of course, also the bad. Uh, the other hand of that is with science and technology, you might have heard of the debate about cloning. Um, is it ethical? Is it not okay? Should we be able to do it using stem cells? And so, again, this is all science in, in, our, in our daily lives. Anybody think any other ones? Everything is science. My kids would tell you. My Legos. <laughs> they're into Lego, Legos right now, and they're into what we, what we would say, the uh, branch of science, engineering, building. And so you think about building infrastructures. It could be roads for transportation. It could be bridges. It could be buildings and houses. Okay, um, another little piece that goes along with that, I'll tell you, there you go, move out of the way. Now let me go to earth science here. This got updated today, so it looks a, a, a whole lot different to me. So bear with me here for just a second. Okay. Another thing that we think about um, with science is how do our actions have an effect? So we think about relationships in an ecosystem. This is activity 631. Let me move that out of the way. And in this particular one, it's looking at um, what kind of effect would occur to biotic factors if water became contaminated by fertilizer, which is an abiotic factor. So when we think about our actions, it also relates to science because we have a cause and effect. Um, biotic factors are non-living factors, biotic factors, sorry, are living factors, and abiotic factors are non-living factors. So um, let's say, you know, you could think about um, illegal dumping. 
instead of fertilizer. Um, if a person was, say, had lots of chemicals, they were working on their house, maybe um, certain types of paints and cleaners that are toxic and hazardous, what if somebody just took those in, you know, dumped it down the drain? How would that affect our biotic factors? Does that make sense? I still got the screen others on here. Is that possibly like that? Is it what? It says others, like with the technology, natural resources. I still have that screen. Is, oh, did mine not load? Oh, okay. It's not showing the other. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I see you move the mouse around. So I'm like, maybe that's a diagram there that I'm not seeing. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. You're welcome. <sighs> So sorry, I don't know. Does that mean that you guys didn't see anything? <laughs> Can you see this now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is going into relationships and ecosystems. So when we think about, you know, our effects, the choices that we make have an effect on, say, an ecosystem. So, you know, why does science matter to us? When we think about it, if we, you know, added a fertilizer, which toxic, um, how would that affect other organisms? So if you, somebody was fertilizing a big old lot of, of land, fertilizing their crops, um, how do you think that would affect the living organisms that live? Okay. Well, it could, you know, be a good thing. Fertilizer could help maybe those plants grow, right? Fertilizer gives it extra nutrients, can help those crops grow bigger or better. But on the other hand, the fertilizer could be damaging to other organisms that live there, like say um, worms that live in the ground or the insects that live in, in, in and around those plants as well. Okay. So it's just kind of thinking about here, our actions um, can have an effect on other parts of thinking about in science. So thinking this one is particular on ecosystems, you know, our actions can affect um, the other things that are around us. We're all kind of connected. Okay. Hopefully science is interesting or at least parts of it, I can tell you, you know, in my own experiences, I have certain branches of science, like earth science and biology that I find that are so much more interesting and relevant to me. Um, and I hope that's the same for you, that at least if you're thinking like, oh, just science, I'm just not into it. At least you can find a little bit of something about it. Maybe you're, you're into your technology, your phones and computers, games, it could be. Um, maybe you're into extracurricular activities that allow you to be outside and so that maybe that technology piece of finding the, the lightest bicycle or the, the skis that make you go the fastest can help you help you out as well. Okay, all I was trying to get to is thinking about science, everything, everything we think about here is science, you know, we're so lucky we have these the technology like right now. We're able to be face to face with one, one each other, but you know we're probably in completely different states, different parts of um, our our country. Um, and again, we've got electricity that we can have, you know, power in our house. And for us right now, it's 100 degrees here. We have AC, <laughs> and that's part of science and technology. So, okay. I'll stop going off about how I, why I like science so much um, and come back to, again, questions that you guys might have about assignments, um, concepts that you're stuck on, an activity, anything I can answer for you right here and now. Again, you can take yourself off mute or you can use the chat box and you can type that in. This is my wait period. I want to make sure <laughs> that I can answer anything and help you guys out. Because again, these sessions, of course, allows me to talk about something that I think is pretty, pretty interesting and show you a little bit more information about it.
but also to help you guys out in, in your course as well. Okay, if something comes to mind, again, you can always send a chat to your, to your science teacher, me or to Jenna, and of course we'll get right back to you to, to get that answered. But please also think about it. We're gonna continue with these sessions. And um, if you have a topic that you would love for me to go over, do a little presentation on, maybe do another little candy lab or something I can come up with, um, I would love to do that. Um, I, I find it much more worthwhile if I know from students, they're like, hey, could you do a little bit more on uh, ecosystems or a little bit more on the solar system? Um, I find that helpful for me as well. So if you have ideas on topics that you would like me to cover or uh, your science teacher, please do let us know. We would love that feedback as well. Okay. Well, I thank you guys for joining. Again, this will be, um, the recording will be set up in the library so that you can come back to it. And I thank you guys again for joining this afternoon. Have a great day. Good luck in your studies. And please, if you get stuck or you need help, reach out to us. We are here to help you. Okay. Have a great day, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Yeah.